Are you telling me that these ravenous beasts listen to Bigfoot now? You don't really expect us to believe that, Marie scoffed, as they said talking over dinner a few nights later. I'll be the first to admit that this was getting stranger and stranger as time went on, but this was happening, and we had no choice but to go with the hand that was being played out in front of us. I never in a million years would have thought that either, so I fully understand where she was coming from. I thought for sure that these things could tear anything that it encountered to shreds. Maybe that's why they don't leave the wood line. Maybe they can't, John said. What about the ones that venture out over here, though, Connie said. What, they're exempt from the rules? I'm sure they had to be boundaries. If Dogman are somehow controlled by Bigfoot, as weird as that is, there had to be some understanding. In all honesty, have any of us seen these creatures outside the woods? I mean, apart from the one that I drew into the corn, and of course that time that it crossed the road, I said. They all thought about it. Well, no, come to think of it, I haven't, Connie said. That night I saw it, it was behind the trees, but still technically in the woods. John interrupted. It came out that night when we were there, and it scratched your truck. It also came up and tore up the side of y'all's house when Ashton and his family lived there too. I also think that's the same one that I shot, John, I said. Maybe that one is the rogue one. There has to be one in every group. My grandpa told me one time that when the children of the Bigfoot grow up, if they're bad, so to speak, they cast them out. Then the Bigfoot have to fend for themselves. Maybe it's the same way here for the Dogman. I knew it was all speculation. We didn't know anything about these creatures. I only know what I know about Bigfoot because of my grandpa. I had no doubt, however, that there are more to those than what my grandpa told me. So what do you guys think Ashton's wife will say about what he's planning, Connie asked. I can only assume that she's not going to want him to do it after what they dealt with while they were here, John said. That's the whole reason they moved to begin with, and here he is wanting to go back into the woods. I knew that that would be a possibility. He could come back here or call John and say that his wife just wasn't going to let him go back in there, knowing what she does. I can't say that I blame her, after we faced what we did in the woods that night. I hoped not, though. We could really use it. Since he lived here and went out there with John, he still knew more than Connie and me. Also, seeing as how he had more experiences with these things, even more than John, he would be very instrumental in helping us. I don't know, Connie said. He seemed pretty adamant about coming back. I guess time will tell, but we need to start restocking all of our supplies, I said. I'm going to pick up some more walkie-talkies. Marie, I know you don't want anything to do with this, and I understand. I wouldn't dare ask you to go back into those woods with us. But we still need your help if you're willing to do that for us. Marie was quiet. I knew she wanted to stay as far away from this thing as possible but she also wanted to be there for her husband and for her friends. How can I help you guys if I'm not in the woods, Murray finally asked. Isn't that where most of the stuff is going to happen? Well, not necessarily, Murray, John said. We could have you stay inside at Mark and Connie's house to be a lookout. You would have your own walkie-talkie for communication, and if you happen to see anything at all, you would just let us know. That simple. That keeps you out of harm's way, but still allows you to be a part of this whole thing. I know deep down you want to help, but I also know that your fear of these creatures is controlling you. I get it. They have set up every safety measure that they can. If anything at all comes on their property, the whole thing lights up like it's noon in the middle of the day. So what do you say? Can you help us out by doing that? John made it as simple as he could for her. He wanted her to feel included and still give her some kind of control. That would also help with her fear. Before Marie had a chance to answer, John's phone rang. It was Ashton. John put the phone on speaker so we could all listen. Hey, so I talked to my wife. She's not entirely sold on the whole idea of me going to chase monsters in the woods with my friends. However, she's sympathetic to the position that you all are in. She remembered how she felt when we lived here. I explained everything to her and told her about the background that we all had in hunting. She knows that our chances of survival would be greater than any novice hunter going out there. That said, she's agreed to me going out with you guys, but only if she can be there as well. However, she doesn't want to be in the woods where either of these creatures live. Would it be okay if she stayed at Mark and Connie's? I jumped on the opportunity. If Marie came along, she wouldn't be alone, and she would be with someone who shared in her opinion about these creatures and how crazy we were for going after them. Tell her that's fine, I told John. You can let her know I'll be there as well, Marie said, smiling. She won't be sitting around an empty house all by herself. John smiled at Marie and let Ashton know that everything would be good on all accounts. Great, Ashton said. 
We will be sending our kids to their grandparents, whichever night we come over. You guys just let me know a day, and I'll let you know when we're on our way. Well, that takes care of that, Connie said, standing up from the table. Come on, Marie. I'll help you with the dishes. They both walked into the kitchen, and John and I walked outside to the front deck. The sun hadn't quite set yet, and we still hadn't heard anything around either of the property since the Bigfoot had chased off the dog man. How crazy is this whole situation, I asked John. Did you ever think in a million years we would become great friends and end up chasing big, bad, scary monsters at night through the woods? John laughed. I can't say that I did, Mark. Not what I expected the first night we met you and Connie, that's for sure. Monsters or not, I was glad that we had formed a friendship with them. I don't remember ever having a friendship quite like this. We shared a lot of commonalities. I think that helped strengthen our bond even more. Then you throw in monster hunting. There's an aspect to a friendship. I had laid in bed one night, almost comparing us to the Ghostbusters. But instead of chasing Slimer or the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, it was Dogman and Bigfoot. In situations like this, you have to make the best of it. You can either laugh at it or live in fear of it. We may not have proton packs or a ghost trap, but we're going to do the best that we can. Some people say that these trail cams can keep them away, so we're going to get these set up in the woods as far back as we can. I think we at least need 10 or 12 of them to put up. Connie and I just went and bought some for our back lot for the animals, so we can use those if we need to. If we're keeping these things away from us altogether, we won't need these for our property anymore. That is, if they even work in keeping them away, I said. Yeah, that's the plan anyway. I would also love to know what power Bigfoot have over the dogmen. I'll have to see if I can drum up any more information about that. It all seems strange to me, John said. I had to agree with him. Granted, Bigfoot generally stood head and shoulders above the dogmen in the woods, and they were certainly bigger in stature. But the dogmen were, or seemed to be, more vicious. Sharp teeth, long claws, and a ravenous appetite. But nonetheless, they were somehow controlled by them. John, you know what I thought of? I asked, moving to the edge of my chair. What's that, partner? He asked. These Bigfoot have had to be here all along. I was just thinking of the situation as a whole and everything that we had learned from Ashton. He said he and his wife had ran from a hyena-looking dogman, and it didn't chase them. Connie was in the car, and it didn't come after her out of the tree line. The only time one of these dogmen made any kind of a threatening maneuver towards us is when we were in the woods, right? So since that's the case, the Bigfoot would have had to have been there. No doubt about it, I explained excitedly. So the one that you shot that did break the line absolutely had to have gone rogue. But that still poses a problem for us. It didn't die after you shot it in the face. Does that mean that any of them can be killed at all? John asked. I had thought about that time and time again, but I could never come up with a logical explanation. None of this was logical anyway. Maybe we won't be able to. Maybe they can only be killed by a Bigfoot. Look, I know that sounds crazy, but honestly, John, this is all crazy. I think we have to start looking at this a little more outside the box than we have been. We come at this from a logical state of mind, and this is so illogical, it isn't even funny. So knowing what we do now, we need to look at this differently. I think that this will help us in the long run. Probably not to defeat the dogmen ourselves, but trusting that somehow Bigfoot can. John slowly rocked in his rocking chair, trying to process everything I'd just told him. I knew it was a stretch, but we'd done everything else. We are, after all, dealing with not one, but two creatures that aren't even supposed to exist, much less both on the same property at the same time. We need to get back into the woods to investigate, but I think we should do it during the day at first. I know dogmen come out during the day, but not quite as often as they do under the cover of darkness. They'll be more cautious and not as apt to attack us. There's no time to waste, John said. The next morning, as soon as the sun rose over the horizon, we all met up at our house. Marie was set up in the kitchen with a walkie for communication, and John, Connie, and I were geared up and ready to set off into the wood line. We gave a few brief instructions to Marie, and we left. We had looked online for what others had found when it came to Bigfoot. Tree structure examples, broken tree limbs, and what possible Bigfoot nests looked like. We hungered for everything we could get our hands on in relation to these two cryptids. Now remember, John said as we drove the short drive into the wood line, this is a scouting mission only. 
We aren't going in to kill anything unless it comes at us first. Ashton will be here tomorrow night. That's when we can hopefully be able to hunt, to kill. Today we are simply looking for signs of Bigfoot. But maybe we'll stumble across something that shows that Dogman is in the same area as well. We trekked the rough terrain off trail. It was so much thicker this way, but Bigfoot doesn't follow trails. Unless they're on game trails, that is. Most of the encounters my grandpa had happened when he went off trail to hunt deer. He would always come back home covered in scratches from briar bushes, covered in mosquito bites, and crawling with ticks. My grandma always gave him down the country for that, too. But he never let it stop him. I remember as a child when I would go there on my summer breaks from school, but I always stayed on the trail. I didn't want any part of what my grandma would dish out if I didn't. I never had one single encounter with them. Maybe that's why. I stayed on the trail. They knew I was there, and they didn't want me to know where they were. Scouting off trail was the way to go in this case. That would give us our best chance to find some of these tree structures or anything else related to them. We would also have the best chance of maybe sneaking up on one of them like Connie and I did that day. That is, if that was a Bigfoot and not a bear. We finally made our way down to the water. John instantly froze when he saw it. I certainly understood why. This was the first time he had been back in this place since that dreadful night that we looked hell right in the face. Are you okay to keep going, John? I asked as the fear was emanating off of him. We all stood still until John was ready to go forward. He took a few deep breaths and we moved along. The rain had washed away all the blood, so there was literally nothing left of that night except our trauma, memories, and our own account of what happened to us. We knew that no one else would believe us, except those we'd already told, and they only believed us because they had experiences of their own. I don't know if I would ever be brave enough to go on to one of those encounter shows that we'd listened to. However, based on others' courage to tell their story, we ourselves had learned a lot. Connie had walked ahead of John and I, and we saw her leaning over at a nearby tree limb. What do you got there, Connie? I asked as I walked up to her. These tree limb breaks are so inconclusive. How can you really tell what did this, she asked as she lifted the broken portion of the tree limb up. Well, it's not the whole tree limb. It's just the portion of the limb that's broken, John said. But I agree. It's hard to say with any certainty. Let's keep moving ahead and see if we can find something else. We had walked quite a ways through the brush, and right in the midst of her walking, Connie froze and pointed. The cave, she exclaimed. No, we're too close. We must turn around. We're right at their front door. John and I walked over and hid behind a big boulder and looked over at the cave. We must have walked clear around the opposite way and were looking at the cave from the other side. There wasn't any movement at all from inside. No noises, no smells. The fact that there could have been close to ten dogmen in there really hit home for us. Just then, we saw one on all fours making its way to the front of the cave from the side. We all knelt down so it wouldn't see us. It must be protecting them so they can sleep. I think I read somewhere that Sasquatch had what some people call day watchers to protect the ones who sleep. I think that's what this one's doing, John whispered. That dogman on all fours had a shoulder height of at least three or four feet tall. Once it stood up, it would be much taller. We had to figure out a way to get out of this before this thing caught wind of us. We need to start making our way back home now, Connie said. I don't like this at all. I think we may be out of range for the walkie-talkie because we haven't heard anything from Marie. The fear on Connie's face was very clear. At times, when something scared her, she would get angry. I could see it building. I stood in front of her and made her stop for a minute just to breathe. I know, seeing one is terrifying. Seeing one in broad daylight is even worse. Just take a second. Mark, we may not have a second until this thing smells us. We have to go now, Connie said angrily. She took off, not being quiet at all. She was snapping twigs and breaking branches as she swiftly moved along. That's all it took. This dogman snapped its head around and scanned the area where we were. It let out a loud howl and then headed in our direction. Mark, Connie, run! It's coming, John yelled. No need to be quiet anymore. We took off out of there like a bat out of hell. We ran as hard as we could. We heard it coming through the trees. Snarling echoed from behind us, and it felt as though each second would be our last. We made it back to the water and quickly stopped to take a break and catch our breath, as much as we could since the noises had lessened. John also reached out to Marie to let her know what happened. Shortly afterwards, though, we started feeling small pelts hitting against our packs. 
We all looked around, confused. Nothing. We all looked up, thinking that maybe something was falling naturally from the trees. However, none of the trees we were surrounded by dropped anything like acorns, pine cones, or anything like that. But still yet, the pelts kept coming. Soon, little stones began hitting the water. It was almost like it was raining rocks every so often. Then the smell hit us. The smell that we had smelled the first day in the woods. It's here, Connie said, as she eyed our surroundings with her weapon drawn. Now, is this dog man, or is it Bigfoot? I couldn't answer her question, and neither could John. The fact of the matter is, the day we smelled it, we couldn't figure it out either. We simply left. That was our plan on this day, too. We quickly retreated and made it back home. I was discouraged that we didn't get all of our trail cams up, but I was glad that out of the 12 of them, we'd gotten at least nine of them put up. We had also seen a possible Bigfoot tree break, but nothing conclusive. But we did find a different way to get to the cave, and then we were chased by a dogman. Again. Afterwards, at the water, what was throwing those small rocks at us? Was it Bigfoot? I mean, I don't see a dogman standing around throwing things at us after it had been violently chasing us. It seems they would have been more likely to have just finished the job and attacked us. I couldn't wait for Ashton to come over tomorrow night. I woke up early the next morning, excited to start the day. A lot of people would call us crazy. If anyone had heard us talking about this, they would swear that we had lost our minds. Hell, before all this started, I would have been the same way. But I have come to grips with this lifestyle. Maybe not the cryptid jungle, as Connie called it. But no matter what is going on out here, I knew this is where we belonged. I could feel it. The day was longer than normal, and I knew why. It was hot and muggy, so when the sun sets this evening, it'll be great. John and Marie came over a little after four that afternoon. We all had an early dinner together and gathered up everything we would need before Ashton and his wife showed up. Connie and I had taken down all the trail cams from around our property earlier in the day. We also went out to get more walkie-talkies. After everything was collected and loaded up, Connie went in and made coffee for Marie and Ashton's wife. Not long after, they showed up. They both came to the door and we welcomed them in. Ashton shook her hands and introduced himself to Marie, since she wasn't there the first time he came over. This is my wife Sabrina, Ashton said. We all introduced ourselves and made our way to the kitchen. I made some fresh coffee, Connie said to Sabrina. Please make yourself at home. If you need anything at all, just let Marie know, and she'll help you. Everything was ready to go, and I was chomping at the bit to get into the woods. I threw on my backpack and went outside to wait on everyone else. About ten minutes later, they piled out the door, and we were off. We climbed into the truck and drove down to the wood line. We sat and waited until the sun had almost set. The cool breeze felt nice as we got out of the truck. Truth be told... I had already started sweating just under the weight of my pack and the camo I'd put on. We came out earlier in the day yesterday. I thought we weren't going to find anything, but I was wrong. We did find a possible tree break from a Bigfoot, but we weren't sure if it was from one of them, maybe another animal walking by and breaking it, or something else altogether. We also found an alternate route to the opposite side of the cave. That's when everything blew up. Then we experienced something that was strange. A pungent smell by the water, and then something was pelting us with small rocks. So, how exactly did everything blow up, though? Ashton asked. I explained everything that happened. Ashton looked around and said, Well, that certainly does add a degree of difficulty for tonight. As far as what you said earlier, the tree break could indicate Bigfoot. I can't be sure, but it's very common that they throw things at people also. No one really knows why, though. It could be them saying that they recognize that you're there, or even that you've interrupted their hunt. Before that, did you hear anything? Nothing like that, Ashton John said. It was as quiet as it could be. Come to think of it, there weren't any noises at all. Nothing from insects or any other type of animal. He was right. I never even picked up on it. But that's true. We completely missed it. If something large is moving through the woods, everything else would be silent. This is where Mark and John encountered the dogman face to face, Connie said as we stood near the water. John sighed. If you were looking through this opening, his whole head filled up that clearing. He was blacker than black, fur covered in blood, red eyes, sharp teeth, and his breath was not so hot. Then I shot it in the face, I said. 
It could have been lying there just over that large mound of dirt at the bottom. Should be, but it wasn't. Yeah, the whole thing sounds bizarre, Ashton said as he looked around. It's a little quieter than I would prefer now. It could only mean that they're around now. Them, or the Bigfoot. Maybe even both. Let's start getting the rest of these trail cams up, please, Connie said. The first one should go here around that tree, facing towards the clearing. Yes, you can't see it because it's so dark, but if you look straight out, you can see the cave, a half a mile from here, John said. We hung the two trail cams in that area because it's the closest to our house and our property. We hung the last one up near the water. Whether it's Dogman or Bigfoot hanging around for the fish, we should get a picture of it. Then hopefully, it'll stay in the woods. We prayed that it would anyway. We carefully made it up to where we'd found the tree break earlier, and Ashton agreed that we couldn't be positive it was done on purpose or by another animal in the woods. You know, the kind that belong here. Ashton hung one of the trail cams on that tree as well, since it was near the cave on the opposite side. Let me ask your opinion, Ashton. The other night, Connie and I were sitting on the back deck, and one of these dogmen came tearing through the woods in our direction. It broke the barrier, and all of our halogen lights came on. But then... We heard a Bigfoot yell. I'm sure that's what it was. It wasn't a howl. It was a yell. As soon as that happened, the dogman backed off and went back into the woods. It never came after us. After that, we ran inside. So, I was putting two and two together, or at least trying to. The only thing that makes sense is that somehow, these Bigfoot creatures are controlling the dogman. They have to be. They're keeping them in the wood line. The one that you and John saw while out hunting and the one that scratched your house had to be a rogue. We also thought that the one I shot had to be a rogue too. Have you ever seen such a thing? I can't say that I have, Ashton said curiously. That, of course, doesn't mean that it's not a thing. I just haven't heard of it. But then again, there aren't too many things about this topic that adds up. Connie reached out and hastily grabbed my arm. Do you hear that? She asked in a panicked tone. It's something heavy moving out in front of us. It's going to get us, Mark. We have to go now, she yelled. I reached over and quickly covered her mouth before she had the chance to yell again. Look, you're not new to this. You have to be quiet. Yes, this is a massive beast. And yes, it's also an animal of some sort. Handle this as you would any normal hunting trip. You wouldn't dare yell like that. I removed my hand from her mouth. She was breathing heavily and fire flew from her eyes in anger. A loud tree knock broke the tension of the situation. What the? Ashton said. Bigfoot, I said. Listen to the footfalls. They're retreating back away from us. Two more knocks followed and then once again, silence. Everything fell as silent as it was when we first got there. Ashton looked at me in surprise. I told you, they control them. It's like a knock of the trees keeps the danger away from us, I said. Ashton let out a small whoop into the darkness, and he got a grunt in return. We walked maybe a mile further into a clearing, and we found what appeared to be a footprint. But before we could examine it, a mid-sized tree got pushed over. We're too close. We have to back out of here, Ashton said. There was no time to explain as we stood up and listened to a different type of thrashing sound. Ashton's eyes were huge, even in the cover of darkness. They're coming. Get out of here now, he exclaimed. They say you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay.